Don't let anybody make you think that God chose America as his divine messianic force to be a sort of policeman of the whole world. God has a way of standing before the nations with judgment, and it seems that I can hear God saying to America, you are too arrogant. And if you don't change your ways, I will rise up and break the backbone of your power. Oh, tap. This is Femi here with Freedom Now, and your ears are in tuned at high frequencies in a liberated zone. Freedom Now is a pan Africanist global news outlet from coast to coast, dispelling the Western propaganda media and their all lies point of views. Freedom Now is devoted to relay true news, views, and proper clues to form solutions around freedom for the oppressed worldwide. Now, get relaxed, grab a pen, and phone a friend, because Freedom Now is set to begin to awaken deep sleepers dreaming about Freedom Now within in Freedom Now in. Barigani. This is Sister Thage with Freedom Now's agenda for the week of October 1st, 2022. We commence with our sister, Luyanda Kaboka and the African Drumbeat Historical Calendar. Then, prolific author, radical historian, professor of African American Studies at the University of Houston, and Freedom Now co-producer, Dr. Gerald Horn interviews, Peter J. Hammer, director of the Damon J. Keith Center for Civil Rights, and Professor of Law at Wayne University, here to discuss his co-authorship of the book, No Equal Justice, The Legacy of Civil Rights Icon, George W. Crockett Jr. And later in the hour, Dr. Horn interviews Linda Burnham, author of the book, Power Concedes Nothing, How Grassroots Organizing Wins Elections. In our music clip mix, we honor the lives of Pharaoh Sanders and Coolio, and our list also includes MLK, Zap Mama, and prison radio commentaries. So sit back, tell a friend, and as always, we stand ready for revolution. Hotep. This is Sister Luyanda Koboka with this October 3rd weekly African drumbeat historical calendar of critical events and leaders which we acknowledge by giving publicity to their contributions so that we may gain inspiration to continue on the battle of human and spiritual values over greed and exploitation. October 3rd, 1952. The Mau Mau revolution against British colonialism begins in Kenya. Mau Mau, or the Kikuyu forest fighters, fought against the British efforts to make Kenya a white settler colonial like South Africa. The Mau Mau, headed by Didon Kamati, strategically targeted African colonial collaborators as their primary target, realizing that without collaborators, England could not sustain domination against the masses of Africans. October 3, 1904. The people of Namibia, Southwest Africa, begin armed struggle against German colonial occupation after the Heru genocidal massacre and the first Holocaust of the 20th century. October 5, 1945. The Fifth Pan African Congress occurred in Manchester, England. This Congress gave a mass working class character to the Pan African movement, as well as having in attendance Jomo Kenyatta, George Padmore, Kwame Nkrumah, C.L.R. James, 
and Amy Garvey, the wife of Marcus Garvey. This Congress called for the organization of mass political parties. It was anti-capitalistic in nature and was the final confrontation with colonialism. October 6, 1917. Fannie Lou Hamer, the powerful civil rights activist from the sharecropper background, was born. She exposed the hypocrisy of the Democratic Party at the 1964 Democratic Convention in Atlantic City when the Democrats refused to acknowledge and seat the majority of citizens of Mississippi who were Africans. October 7, 1897. Elijah Muhammad, the leader of the Nation of Islam, was born. The Nation of Islam, the largest Islamic activist organization in the United States, under the teachings of Elijah Muhammad, many convicts and gang members were transformed into contributing members of the African community. October 8, 1804, Haiti becomes an independent nation after decades of brutal colonialism under the French. October 8, 1967, the U.S. CIA and its local puppets murder Che Guevara in Bolivia. Che, the co-architect of the Cuban Revolution and an internationalist who fought in the Congo and throughout South America against Western colonial and neo-colonial domination of humanity. October 9, 1980. Sister Ida Jimmy, the militant freedom fighter of Namibia, was imprisoned by the racist South African government, which refused the people of Namibia self-determination. October 9, 1823. Mary Ann Shard Carey, an African organizing in the U.S. and Canada, was a champion to fugitive slaves. She was the leader of the black immigration movement. She was also the first black woman to establish a newspaper in North America. This is Freedom Now, 90.7 FM in Southern California and 98.7 FM in Central California. Please check out our website at kpfk.org. Under Programs, then click on Freedom Now. As in our tradition to build unity, we request that you join us by chanting Amandla Awe to three times. This Azanian rally cry means the power is ours, so join us wherever you are. Amandla Awe to, Amandla Awe to, Amandla Awe to. This is Gerald Hora for KPFK, kpfk.org. And with me on the line is Peter J. Hammer, A. Alfred Topman Professor of Law and Director of the Damon J. Keith Center for Civil Rights at Wayne State University in Detroit and co-author of the book, No Equal Justice, The Legacy of Civil Rights Icon George W. Crocker Jr. Welcome to Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Peter J. Hammer. Thank you for having me, Gerald. And thank you for joining us. And I should mention just to begin that uh, George W. Crockett Jr., I happen to know because he was in the vanguard of campaigning against apartheid in South Africa before 1994. And during my activist years in New York City during that period, I once solicited from him a personal check of $5,000 for the aim of, of bringing recently free political prisoners from Namibia, uh, which came to independence in 1990, uh, to the United States. And as a judge, he was in national headlines, as we shall discuss, for refusing to crack down, as the authorities wanted, on the Republic of New Africa. As a lawyer, he toiled on behalf of the United Auto Workers, Mississippi protesters in the 1960s. In 1949, he was a lawyer in the trial of the century of the U.S. Communist Party leadership, a trial that led to the imprisonment not only of the defendants, but the attorneys, including George W. Crockett Jr. So having said that, Peter J. Hammer, why did you write this book? Well, because I, I think as your, your, your introductory remarks are suggesting, 
uh, George Crockett is the hero we all need in this moment uh, and the hero that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, so my co-author, uh, uh, Ed Littlejohn, uh, who knew Judge Crockett and started this process in the 1990s, uh, we were going to make sure that his story was not going to be lost for history. Uh, and we want to publish it now because we really think it speaks to the issues of our time as well. So what was the Republic of New Africa and describe the controversy involving Judge Crockett and the Republic of New Africa? Yeah, so this is in 1968, 1969. The Republic of New Africa was one of these uh, emerging black power organizations, uh, although they were, were, were black separatists. Uh, and they were holding their second annual convention at the New Bethel Church, uh, which was stewarded by C.L. Franklin, who was Aretha Franklin's father. Uh, and there was an altercation outside. Uh, one police officer was killed and another police officer was shot. And within minutes, uh, scores of police officers show up at the scene, which shows you how heavily surveilled that the, the conference was. Uh, and with guns blazing, they invaded the church. Uh, and it's a miracle that nobody got killed inside the church. Uh, but two years after the Detroit rebellion, which was caused by a mass arrest, they arrested 144 uh, men, women, and children uh, and took them down to the to the first precinct uh, court or uh, uh, police station. And what did Judge Crockett do at that point? Yeah, so C.L. Franklin, who was a, a civil rights leader in Detroit, uh, uh, Jamie Del Rio, a state representative, uh, go knocking on Judge Crockett's door a little after 5 a.m. on a Sunday morning. Right? Uh, and within one hour, uh, Crockett is at the police station uh, with a writ of habeas corpus in hand, demanding that the police commissioner contact the prosecutor and give him space inside the police station to start holding hearings, right? Uh, and for every individual that the police did not have evidence to show probable cause of arrest, he was setting free, right? So uh, a, a really an amazing example uh, of the law actually working uh, for Black Americans uh, and, and the important role that a Black judge can make uh, in enforcing constitutional rights. But then I would say the next day all hell breaks loose. Uh, the governor's calling for his uh, impeachment, the mayor's calling for his impeachment, the state senate is passing a resolution for his impeachment, impeachment uh, and the story becomes Crockett, black judge, protects individual rights uh, as opposed to a Republican New Africa uh, kill a police officer. Mm -hmm. And he also was a lawyer in Mississippi during the heat of the struggle in the 1960s working with the National Lawyers Guild, which in turn had come under attack by the U.S. authorities because of its left-wing leanings. Talk to us about that. Yeah, so people don't really appreciate the important role that the National Lawyers Guild played in the civil rights struggle by facilitating uh, uh, the work of getting a white uh, or, or, or lawyers from the North uh, to go down and protect the rights of civil rights workers in the South. Uh, so they were doing that up and it culminated really in, in Mississippi summer in, in Mississippi 1964 uh, and George Crockett was heading the NLG uh, office uh, in Jackson, Mississippi uh, and, and really putting his life on the line as did the other lawyers uh, in that incredible struggle and there's a portion of the book that details how he was the lawyer uh, the Goodman, uh, uh, Cheney and, and Schwermer called uh, to get legal advice about how to make a civil rights case before they went to uh, investigate the church bombing in, in Philadelphia, Mississippi. Uh, and we all know the, the, the story of, of those three uh, civil rights of, of martyrs. Uh, but Crockett was the lawyer in chief uh, answering the questions of people like uh, uh, Michael Schwerner. Now, my understanding is, is that the NAACP was not necessarily sympathetic to George Crockett's venture into Mississippi. Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the first was a lot of fissures within the civil rights movement, including those that were supporting SNCC. Uh, uh, but uh, the, the most important thing is that those were, uh, throughout the civil rights movement, largely uh, establishment civil rights, right? They were very careful of the cases they would take. Uh, whereas if you're doing bottom up lawyering, kind of movement lawyering like Crockett was, uh, you're on the ground helping folks in the movement at the grassroots level. Uh, and there was a lot of tension between that strategy uh, and the strategy of the ACLU and the NAACP and a lot of other more establishment civil rights groups. Speaking of other conflicts with establishment civil rights groups, as noted in 1949, he was an attorney for the U.S. Communist Party leadership in what was described as the trial of the century. 
and as noted, the defendants were imprisoned and so was George Crockett. But I understand that he was upset with NAACP lawyer Thurgood Marshall, future Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall. Why was that? Yeah, so sort of two episodes. First, the, 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 the listener should know that the United States versus Dennis was putting the Communist Party on trial for what they thought and not what they did. Uh, and it historically has become to, to be known as, as really the lowest point of the First Amendment uh, in, in American history. Uh, and, and Crockett went to jail uh, for defending the rights of others and protecting the First Amendment, you know, which shows his, his courage in this principle. In contrast, there are two points that, that he ran into Thurgood in, in a very negative way. Uh, one was that he wanted the NAACP to be uh, giving an amicus brief challenging jury selection processes. Uh, and there's a longer story in the, the book about Walter White and, and, and why it was particularly appropriate for the NAACP to do so. Uh, and, and Marshall refused to do so, largely because they didn't want to take the political heat uh, that it would take by actually standing and representing and defending uh, the rights of an unpopular uh, party. The second point came when the National Bar Association, which is the, 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 the Bar Association of, of, of African Americans historically, uh, wanted to pass a resolution uh, in support of Crockett. Uh, and, and, and Thurgood Marshall was speaking out against that, right? And what Marshall, what, what, what Crockett said is uh, he lost a lot of respect for, for Marshall. Uh, not that, you know, Marshall didn't accomplish some amazing things, but what Crockett said is you know a person when it comes down to the nitty gritty. Right. Uh, and when you're not there to help somebody, when it comes down to the nitty gritty, it really shows your character. Uh, and as a result of those episodes, Crockett had a, a, a very tarnished view of, of Thurgood Marshall. He was also a lawyer in the 1950s after leaving in prison, leaving imprisonment uh, for witnesses before the House Un-American Activities Committee, including as a lawyer for the future black mayor of Detroit, speaking of Coleman Young. Talk to us about that. Yeah, and and and, and the listeners should again imagine how polarized we are today. Probably the, the earlier point of polarization was the McCarthy era in the 1950s. Uh, and nobody would step up and defend these people, right? It was a handful of lawyers, including Judge Crockett, that would do so. Uh, and they were abusing federal authorities. This is we're hearing the January 6th uh, uh, hearings coming out. Uh, and Crockett would defend people like Coleman Young. Uh, and, and again, this is beyond the time we have here, but the, the, the testimony of Coleman Young was actually pressed into a record uh, because he so embarrassed the members of the, of the committee that that became one of the catalysts that really solidified his, uh, uh, his reputation. But a point to link these two stories, Crockett learned that he was going to jail. He got the uh, 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 results of the Supreme Court decision that uphold, held his conviction. And shortly after having that, he went back to the Detroit HUAC hearings uh, and represented clients. Right. So it just says he put other people in front of himself, even on arguably one of the worst days of his life. Now, that record that was trust, is that online or is it in an archive or both? Uh, I don't know if it's online, but it's certainly worth Googling because uh, you, you, you just you see the brilliance of Coleman Young. You see the bigotry of the Southern uh, uh, congressman uh, and you laugh at the same time. So those are three great things that we need in, in, in these stressful times. So what about one of his first jobs as a lawyer for the United Auto Workers, focusing on the protection of black workers. Talk about that, please. Yeah, so he, he, he really was a, 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 an all-star attorney coming out of, of, of law school. Uh, one of the, the first black lawyers ever to be hired by the Department of Labor, uh, the first factual investigator equivalent of an ALG for the Fair Employment Practices Commission, was hired by the UAW in order to fight racism inside the union. Uh, and this was at a time of great contest inside the UAW that really uh, uh, determined the fate of the union uh, uh, to this day, where Walter Ruther uh, rose to power. And when Walter Ruther rose to power, uh, uh, he purged the union of people like Crockett and, and Marie Sugar and, and Ernie Goodman and, and others who were viewed by, by Ruther as, as too liberal. Uh, so by standing up for rights again inside the union, uh, demanding that Ruther, who was the, in charge of the, the, the General Motors contract at that time, include a non-discrimination provision, uh, he got on Ruther's bad side. And when Ruther gained power, uh, Ruther purged uh, the entire uh, liberal wing. Now, let's go back to the 1960s and the Detroit Rebellion of 1967, not unlike the Watts Revolt of 1965 in Los Angeles. What was his role during the Detroit Rebellion of 1967? 
Yeah, you got to imagine this, that, 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 that in some respects, he was a very young judge. Uh, he was elected in 1966. He took office uh, in, in January of 1967, just uh, uh, barely six, seven months before the rebellion. Uh, the other thing you know is he was actually uh, uh, getting ready for this job his whole life. Um, so uh, you have the rebellion, you have these mass arrests, you have this movement where the prosecutors are demanding that judges uh, establish $10,000 bonds for everybody arrested. Right? And I said that right. The prosecutor was demanding that the judges, which is just asked backwards, uh, set these high rates. And Crockett refused to do so. You said Crockett said, I'm going to establish an individual, not a collectivized manner to determine risk of, 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 of the, the individual defendants. He established a very clever way of, of recruiting networks of, of neighborhood legal services lawyers that he had been affiliated with before uh, in order to actually find out who these people were as individuals, what risk they had. And he gave bonds that reflected the actual level of risk. Right? Uh, and, and his position was vindicated and praised by the University of Michigan Law Review uh, in a study of the rebellion of, of, a few years later. And you mentioned, of course, that he matriculated at the law school at the University of Michigan. I should also mention that he was a Morehouse man. Yeah, and, and, and we all know what he would say is more important. Uh, he was a Morehouse man all his life. Uh, and uh, the, the book details some of the, not some, many of the, 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 the sort of discriminatory and racial uh, problems that he faced when he got to Ann Arbor. Now, remind us again, how many individual defendants were there during the Detroit Rebellion of 1967? That, uh, I, there, were, there were legions. There were hundreds, if not thousands of people who were being arrested. Uh, mm -hmm. There were so many people arrested, they were being held in buses, right, without sanitation. Uh, they were put in, in zoo cages on Belle Isle. Uh, so, I mean, just imagine these zoo cages? Things, zoo cages, yeah. These sort of parts of these stories, little details that uh, uh, don't receive the, 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 the notoriety that they should uh, historically. Hmm. Now, when was he elected to Congress and describe his role in Congress? I already made reference to his role combating apartheid. And of course, he fought to keep U.S. troops out of El Salvador. He fought against the invasions of Grenada and Panama. He fought against aid to the counter revolutionaries in Nicaragua. So when was he elected? And give us a snapshot of his, his congressional career. Yeah, so he, he didn't run for re-election for recorder's court judge in, 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 in 78 uh, uh, because of the, the problems that, that Charles Dick, Congressman Diggs, was experiencing and having to leave, uh, a seat opened up. Uh, and, and Crockett was bored being retired. Uh, so he threw his hat in the ring. And you can imagine, uh, given the, 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 the little glimpses into his record you've heard, Crockett was probably the most in, of, of a popular uh, figure in Detroit at that time next to Coleman Young. Uh, so when he decided to, to, to run, uh, it was a guaranteed win. Uh, and it was a win every time he ran for re-election and was in Congress for 10 years. But if you want the snapshot, uh, a good part of his uh, work was trying to defend the New Deal against Ronald Reagan's attack. So on the domestic side, he was trying to, to preserve the welfare state and the New Deal programs that, that, that Reagan was dismantling. Uh, and, and internationally, uh, he was the chair of the uh, of subcommittee on the Western Hemisphere. So all of these issues with the Contra, with uh, 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 El Salvador, with uh, other invasions happening in, in, in the Caribbean and, and Central and, and Latin America, uh, Crockett was in the center of that storm demanding uh, factual hearings, demanding uh, that the law be followed where in the contrast it wasn't, and demanding policies that were, were, were directed towards peace uh, and not militarization of the region. Uh, and then finally, uh, you'd say his third larger area was, was South Africa, uh, where he took his fight for civil rights that was local and made that global, uh, and one, one of the earliest people to be raising the consciousness uh, of the United States uh, and the world uh, about the plight of South Africa and the plight of, of Mandela. Uh, so just really this hero decade after decade from the 30s all the way to the 90s uh, when he finally stepped down from Congress. Mm. Now, finally, Peter J. Hammer, professor of law at Wayne State University, co-author of the book, No Equal Justice, The Legacy of Civil Rights Icon George W. Crocker Jr. How would you describe the legacy of civil rights icon George W. Crocker Jr.? Yeah, a man of principled courage. Uh, and that is so missing today. Uh, the other thing I would say, and I, I, I really believe if, if, if people read the book uh, and we consciously structured it in a way that you get long quotations from Crockett, you hear his voice, you get to know Crockett when you're reading the book, uh, that he's speaking to the issues of our time. Uh, Eddie Glaude in his book 
of, of black democracy or democracy in black has this really a, a stunning critique of, of black liberalism, right? And the narrowing of the political mindset and the, the policies that we can even imagine today. Uh, Crockett's coming out of a, a, an era that's very different from that kind of, of, of liberalism. Uh, so the things you hear Crockett say speak to people today, I think speak to young people today uh, in ways that we don't hear anybody speaking uh, today, the last three or four decades. Uh, and it's incredibly refreshing to be reminded that we had giants and heroes and that their inspiration is just as relevant to us today as it was for the decades in which they were fighting for justice. Well, I'm afraid we're going to have to leave it there. Peter J. Hammer, A. Alfred Topman, Professor of Law and Director of the Damon J. Keith Center for Civil Rights at Wayne State University in Detroit and co-author of the book, No Equal Justice, The Legacy of Civil Rights Icon, George W. Crockett Jr. Thank you for joining us on Freedom Now, KPFK, Los Angeles. This is Sister Flora, and you are listening to Freedom Now at KPFK 90.7 FM in occupied Mexico, including Los Angeles, 98.7 FM Santa Barbara, 93.7 FM in San Diego, and streaming live on the web at kpfk.org. Today's program, as well as 10 prior editions, can be reheard at kpfk.org slash audio archive, and scroll down to Freedom Now. From 12 to 1 p.m., following Freedom Now is her sister Asunta, with Spotlight Africa addressing issues facing Mother Africa. For a truly alternative international perspective on world affairs, check out RTTV Russia, CCTV China, and online at Presna, Latina Cuba, Telesor, Venezuela. News 24, South Africa, and Press TV, Ireland. Power and the money, money and the power, minute after minute, hour after hour, everybody's running, but half of them ain't looking, it's going on in the kitchen, but I don't know what's cooking, they say I got to learn, but nobody's here to teach me, if they can't understand it, how can they reach me, I guess they can't, I guess they won't, I guess they front, That's and up next, prison radio commentaries. Hi, my name is Crystal Clark, my MA number is 435. 435- I'm in WAC, the Valley of Death. This is so true, the Valley of Death. We just had another death. The young lady committed suicide. She told them that she was going to kill herself. They let her. This is so sad. Young lady, 30 years old. Her name is Kiki. I will get the last name. Got one child. They are here. This is just so sad. This is sad. Then we got another one in the hospital who's not going to make it. This is this is ridiculous. Like, someone needs to be charged with this. It should not be no way that mental and mental health or even the warden, the government, anything. When these people saying they're going to kill themselves and y'all don't take it serious, look how many people we are lost for this, due to this. The like lady, 30 years old, ain't got too long. If she had that much time to go home. Like, and y'all didn't pay attention to that and watch that. Now the young lady is gone and she could have been alive. This needs to stop. Then you got these people over here, think that need to go to the hospital, just, just sitting there. Like, and y'all, the face firm, the hospital, that little thing they got over there, it's ridiculous. It's sad. This is, this has to stop. This needs to stop. We need help. Like, this is so sad. My heart is like, oh my God, when I heard it, like, this is terrible. And no one, they just covered it up. No. She could have been, had her life. It don't matter what she said, either mental, whatever. It, it, she should have been watched at all times. She still would have been here. Like, and y'all telling the family all kinds of lies. And y'all know this ain't true. Y'all, y'all, y'all reporting these deaths and then lying about them. This is not right. These people got kids and family out there that love them that they want to go home to and now they can't. This needs to stop. All this stuff that's going on in this prison is a cover-up. The warden, Holly Washington, whatever they want to say, she came here, they said the other day, walked through here, and didn't do nothing, didn't say nothing. It just, she, she should be charged, too. Like, this is unstoppable. Like, this so much going on. We're, this place is sick. You got the inspectors working with the inmates against their like, the own officers. You got inmates talking to officers like that in the higher-up letter. Like, this this. This is unstoppable. Like, we need help. I'm going to keep on saying that we need help. 
I feel this. They playing games. They tell my people who are here. Tell me a day I'm going to see the people. I haven't saw people. I still got running all out my ear. My whole body swole. These knots is going in my throat. <clears> this <throat> is my stuff. Like, it's a lot of people getting cancer. We don't know why this water still got a bacteria. It's not safe to drink. It stinks like mold. We shoving that cold water airborne on us. And then they, they got inmates rubbing it off with a... Uh, Tweezers and stuff, trying to get the mold off, get to stand and get with their girlfriends, to get brownie points, and making this, this making other people sick. I'm highly allergic to it. This is just, this is not stuff. Like it's a lot of quirky stuff, and they trying to turn us against each other, and a lot of us falling for it because they don't have no report. This is all they have, and they just go along with it against each other. This this hurts my heart. My heart is really hurt. Like I never ever saw, <laughs> saw nothing like this in my life. Like. The work, the, the some of the staff, I'm not about to stay up here and say that some of the officers, they try to do their job, but shit, they, they let the inmates, the higher up, let the inmates run out. So when they try to help, they get in trouble. When they doing the right thing, they got to be doing bad things to get a, a reward or a trophy. They got to do what the work or whatever wants them to do to get a trophy. This needs to stop. I wish they could play these cameras, and I hope they do investigating on that death with this young lady when she's just telling them the cameras prove everything, the witness prove everything. Like, come on, man. This baby, this lady had a child, 30 years old. These commentaries are recorded by Prison Radio. <laughs> Hi, my name is Crystal Clark. My MA number is 435064. I'm in WAZ. The Valley of Death. <laughs> when I say this is the Valley of Death, it is. This is sad. Like, my life, like, uh, I've been trying to deal with it for years. <laughs> and for the last <coughs> couple weeks, I have been getting sad. I walk around here with a smile on my face, but it's miserable. <laughs> I'm just going through so much right now. I've been so sick. <coughs> the Sergeant Price, thank you. To him, he called healthcare yesterday. Get me over there. The doctor who was over there. It was so sad. This is so sad. <laughs> My whole body is, like I say, I'm so big. I'm leaking fluid. Ugh, I can barely breathe. My throat is full of nodules, whatever they say they is. They getting bigger. <laughs> uh, my chronic cough. This place is really killing me. Like, we had another uh, lady who passed. They covered up. We just found out that. But I will be getting the young lady name. <coughs> uh, I get over there. The doctor see the stuff all the caked up. It's all in my ear. The ear infection, the fungus in my ear just running. She see my face. I'm numb. I can't feel nothing on my right side of my face. My eyes. I'm losing my eyesight. Like, she looked at me like, oh, it's nothing wrong. You've been dealing with this for a long time. Oh, you can deal with it. Like, just deal with it. It's, just deal with it. I was looking at her. Like, she's like, but today is my last day, so. <coughs> Dad, have something planned for you. The warden, I have been talking to him. He just been telling me lies and lies about my health. Like, he's saying that I'm going to see somebody. I should have been went out. I, I can't even really do my test for my heart because they haven't sung me out. I have WPW. <coughs> the heart condition. They supposed to be sung me out to take the little test for it so I can't get help on that. They haven't, none of my appointments, I haven't went out to, to the hospital, to the specialist. They covering this up. They covering everything up because they don't want people to know. But everybody is seeing it and then they get mad because I reported and then they hear me over here and they come, some of we heard... I don't even know how could a, even a staff or officer or the warden or <coughs> the nurses, anybody can get mad when they hear me, when they know it's the truth. Like, if it don't fit you, don't worry about it. If it's not you doing it, why are you so angry and y'all want to toot y'all nose up at me and do this when y'all know I'm, I'm messed up in here? Y'all know this place that took me down. Y'all, Most of y'all admit, like, you don't even look the same. I'm dying in here like literally like it's killing me like it's my body when i lay down you can just feel the stuff growing in my ear my body you can feel these knots like when i walk now it's i get this numb this tingling it's it's, it's, it's terrible my whole body like it's terrible 
But for a doctor to sit up there and report that she don't see nothing, and she's like, oh, just give her some antibodies. And I'm like, I've been on so many antibodies. It's time to send me out. Why you, y'all you send everybody else out? Why is y'all who will send me out? Ever since they found out I was allergic to the mold and it's been affecting me, they've been downplaying my health. They have been downplaying it. Like, I'm still here. I'm suffering. They have been downplaying a lot every time it comes to me. And I'm asking her, I said, you're supposed to be a doctor. Like, help. she was asking what I want her to do. I said, I want you to help me. And if you can't, send me out. Like, send me out. I'm on so much medicine. Nothing is working. It just get worse. Like, I want to make it out of here to see my kids. There's so many of us dying here. And then it's just being covered up. And nobody didn't even talk about it. It go on when you die one day. And then it's over with. Like, this is not right. Like, I've been, I've talked to everybody that has been lying to me. I need to get to the hospital. Like, I'm tired of laying in this bed. I'm tired of walking around here with a smile on my face. And it's in pain. Like, <laughs> you gotta be like, nothing is wrong. I'm sick of this. Like, I won't back to being me, Crystal. I am not me. I haven't been me in a long time. Like, I'm ready <laughs> to be back me. At least, let's make the start. Y'all send me out. Like, let's do one stuff at a time. They're not even trying to do that. The nurse, McIntyre, whatever, I think that's her name. The way how she treat me, I thought she cared about us. The way how she do it, I'm looking at her like, you've been knowing my situation. Won't you let the doctor know? Oh, I don't see nothing either. These commentaries are recorded by Prison Radio. We will now continue with historian professor Dr. Gerald Horn. This is Gerald Horn for KPFK, kpfk.org, and with me on the line is Linda Burnham, co-editor of the book, Power Concedes Nothing, How Grassroots Organizing Wins Elections. Welcome to Freedom Now, KPFK Los Angeles, Linda Burnham. Thank you so much, Gerald. Thank you, Professor. I really do appreciate the opportunity to speak with your listening audience. And we appreciate the opportunity as well. So why did you help to produce this volume? This volume came about because uh, it, in the work that I do, I'm in contact with a lot of people who are doing grassroots organizing, who've done amazing work over the past uh, many years. And they're sectors of the progressive to left side of the spectrum that have, I think, taken a turn in the last 15 to 20 years. Um, and that turn has been to really think about and implement strategies that link long-term political organizing, whether it's constituency-based organizing or issue-based organizing, that link that work to the electoral arena, to electoral organizing, and who have a, an approach to electoral organizing that brings values and principles of ongoing grassroots organizing to that work. I felt, and my co-editors, I, I co-edited this book with Max Elbaum and Maria Poblet, we felt that it was really important that that work be lifted up and documented. And uh, knowing how busy organizers operate they uh, go from one campaign to the next. Oftentimes they don't have much time for reflection. And we all uh, lose because of that. We don't know what it takes to uh, put together uh, an electoral campaign on the progressive side of the spectrum. And, um, you know, 20 years later, someone will, a historian will come and say, well, so what did it look like? What did it take to defeat Trump in 2020? And uh, people will have moved on. So I wanted, I wanted those stories told in the voices of the people who actually did the work. Uh, we felt like it was a way for people to document, to reflect, to share lessons so that people in Nevada knew what people had done in Arizona and people in Arizona knew what people had done in Pennsylvania, onto Florida, Georgia, and et cetera. So it's a documentation process. It's an analysis process. It's let's be disciplined and actually say what we wanted to do, 
what we did do and what the results were. Mm -hmm. So you were formerly National Research Director and Senior Advisor of the National Domestic Workers Alliance. What was the, N or what is the NDWA and what did your job entail? The National Domestic Workers Alliance uh, is getting ready to celebrate its 15th anniversary. As a matter of fact, it's gonna celebrate its 15th anniversary uh, come September. And the National Domestic Workers Alliance is an organization that uh, fights for the rights, the labor rights of women who have been dismissed as unorganizable. So this is nannies, house cleaners, and elder caregivers in the main. It's a largely but not solely immigrant workforce. Um, a fairly high percentage of that workforce is undocumented and they face conditions on the job um, in some cases that people actually could not imagine <laughs> uh, exist in now in the 21st century. Um, and so this organization was formed, uh, it uh, grew out of organizing in cities, local cities, uh, it was spontaneously organized. Domestic workers came together and sat in, in church basements and around kitchen tables and talked about their working conditions. These are workers from the Caribbean, from Mexico, from Central America, from Asia, uh, Philippines. And um, they started talking about their conditions and they started talking about what they could do about those conditions. And 15 years ago at uh, a US social forum that took place in Atlanta, they got together and they decided that they would uh, join together to try and figure out how to improve their conditions. And they've been at it ever since. My job there was uh, their first research director. I came on very early, um, early in the story. And we were, uh, you know, trying to pass legislation at, in, at city councils and in state legislatures. Uh, to guarantee domestic workers, for example, uh, minimum wage, uh, to deal with um, wa uh, wage theft. And uh, when we talked to legislators, they wanted to know, well, what is actually going on? They, so we, there was no empirical research, long story short. There was no empirical research at a national level about what the conditions of domestic workers were. And so I was brought on to be part of a team. I became the research national research director at, um, at the Domestic Workers Alliance. And uh, we put together the first empirical study uh, of domestic workers. That was back, I guess, in 2012, maybe. Um, and so we did that. And then we did a study of domestic workers at the Texas-Mexico border and et cetera. So I, I came on as research director. Mm -hmm. Now, back to the book. Much of the book, as you've already suggested, deals with the attempt to defeat Trumpism in 2020. Uh, he has a base, as we know, 75 million strong. And I'm wondering, how do you and your writers in this book analyze the composition of that base and any special problems that that composition presents? Well, I don't know that you'll find uh, there, there are many things that you'll find in the book. So the, the way that the book is organized is in, in several different sections. So the first section of the book looks at building progressive power in the state. So it looks at what folks did in Georgia, what folks did in Michigan, in uh, Arizona, in Virginia, in Florida, Pennsylvania, um, basically state uh, state-based power building strategies, right? It goes state by state. And, and uh, each of those states obviously is slightly different in, in many ways, including in terms of what the composition of uh, Trump's base looks like. That's the first section. The second section has to do with, is called Communities of Color Drive the Win. And it talks about black voters in 2020, Asian voters and uh, Latinx voters and indigenous voters in 2020. Then there's a section on workers on the doors that talks about how the unions uh, engaged and and um, non-unionized workers, how they engage 
in the electoral arena. And then the last section is on uh, Bernie and democratic centralism, democratic socialism uh, and the, in the primaries. So uh, I, I think some of the most relevant um, analysis and work of Trump's base comes in partly in a chapter about Georgia and about an organization called Surge, which I think is uh, the acronym for Standing Up for Racial Justice. And what Standing Up for Racial Justice does is, uh, in this case in Georgia, knocked on the doors of white folks, essentially. White folks who um, might or might not be open to a conversation, a long conversation about uh, the politics of the day and um, why, where, which way they were leaning. Folks whose doors had not been knocked on by progressive to left folks for a very long time. And what this organization, Surge, does, it essentially is to try and get at the working class segment of Trump's base. Trump's base is broad, obviously. Is across essentially, from my point of view, is a cross class pro racist alliance, now cross class pro racist, pro fascist alliance. Um, and, uh, and, and that has become even more clear since the election and since the January 6th uprising. Uh, and, and so, uh, so the book addresses this in in relationship to the work of organizations like Surge, um, in the uh, work of organizations um, in Virginia, Virginia New Majority, trying to figure out how, uh, especially to be in conversation with folks who um, maybe might be soft Trump supporters, or many people who did. Um, you know, Obama and then Trump uh, and trying to figure out how to kind of pick at that, pick at that alliance and, and start to break that apart in ways that uh, create more favorable terrain for progressive politics. Uh, that job has not become easier in the last few weeks. <laughs> That's great. So you mentioned in passing the role of unions and from reading the book it seems that service employees international union played a major role in terms of the efforts you're describing are there any other unions besides seiu that you would single out in that regard uh there are probably many but in terms of the book the um i think some of the key um chapters to read are the chapter about Unite Here and the work that was done in uh, Nevada. Um, that's, that takes the form of a conversation uh, between uh, Mario Yadida and Stephanie Greenlee and Diana Va uh, Valles. And um, so they talk about what, you know, what it took to do the work in Nevada, what it took to, to knock on the doors. There's another piece uh, by Hani Khalil out in uh, Texas that talks about the Gulf Coast Area uh, Labor Federation and the, and the work that they did. Um, there's also uh, a piece that I worked on with Ajin Pu that talks about the domestic workers. The domestic workers have a um, electoral arm that's called Care in Action. And through Care in Action, um, domestic workers knocked knocked on doors in seven different states. And so um, I was fortunate enough to be able to be in conversation with some of the folks who did that work, some of the folks in Georgia in particular. And um, there are some really inspiring stories there about people finding that they're good at this, for example. You know, I, I, yeah, I've, I've door knocked in my day. I'm not particularly good at it. 
but they're people who are really good at engaging people, knocking on a door, engaging people in a sustained conversation. It's also a way of uh, developing the leadership of union members or folks who are in, in, in uh, worker centers, uh, developing their own leadership capacities. Um, and there are also uh, ways in which this work uh, builds a set of skills that are transferable, some skills that are transferable, some skills that are not. So I would suggest that folks who are interested in the book look at those chapters because it, there is much that was was done uh, um, by uh, trade unionists and by folks who are oriented towards labor rights uh, to move this work. Now, on page 101, references made to the cases of George Floyd, and Brianna Taylor of Louisville, Kentucky. And I'm wondering how did this anti-Trump coalition incorporate black liberation issues in your grassroots organizing? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and I think uh, I think folks will really want to, um, and it's not just because it's one of the chapters I worked on, but we'll really want to look at the chapter on Georgia where we interview uh, Nse Ufat of um, maybe New Georgia Alliance and Cliff Albright of um, Black Voters Matter. Um, and then there's, there's also uh, a, a chapter which talks about Black voters in uh, 2020, and that features uh, out of North Carolina, uh, Sindolo Diamina and several others. And um, that relationship is the, the ability of folks to understand electoral organizing and mobilizing the Black vote as one crucial piece of a broader approach to both opening up and preserving democratic space, but also to visions of what Black liberation could look like, people come with how do we, how do, how do we use this work to empower rather than to, you know, old style, fly in, fly out consultants. People come in, they spend a couple of weeks and they're back out, right? So how is it that we use this work to develop deep ties in community, to identify community leaders. This is not only done on the Black side, it's also done on the Latino side. How do we have consciousness about uh, this work in the context of broader political goals? So I think there are several uh, chapters that, that uh, address that uh, in the book. The uh, work of the North North Carolina Federation. Um, uh, Sendolo speaks uh, to exactly that. Uh, Mondale Robinson uh, heads up something called the Black Male Voter Project, something like that. I'm not sure I'm getting all these names quite right, but he um, he talks about what, where to have conversations and how do you open conversations and how do you sustain conversations with people who um, are like, why am I still voting? This is clearly not the path to liberation. <laughs> why do you want Why do you want me to vote? Those are important conversations to be held, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so I think there's there's a particularly given the the time frame of uh, that, that 2020 was an incredible year. So particularly given what that year looked like. Um, we, uh, people really dug in on understanding this work in a broader context. You know, when people are passing laws that you cannot, uh, pass out water. And meanwhile, people are standing in line, uh, to vote for hours. And they're trying to pass a law that says, uh, you can't pass water out to those folks, many of whom are older folks. Uh, that folks do not want you to vote. 
So uh, understanding that and understanding what are the kind of cultural mm, levers to open up the conversation, to encourage people, to inspire people, all of that is in the book. Mm -hmm. Finally, Linda Burnham, co-editor of the volume, Power Concedes Nothing, How Grassroots Organizing Wins Elections. Let us conclude with a compound question. That is to say, you come from a long line of activists. I understand that as a youth, you knew the great late Paul Robeson. Any recollections of him? And secondly, and similarly important, your mother, Dorothy Burnham, is a centenarian. I think she's about 107 years old right now. The lesson we should take away from that is that activism keeps one alive. But how is she doing? All right, to that compound question. Um, our, our family was uh, related to Paul both on a personal level and also he and my father. My father's name was Lewis Burnham. And uh, among many things, my, both of my parents worked in Alabama in the 40s, uh, pre civil what we understand to be the civil rights movement actually started before the 50s. They were working in Birmingham, Alabama in the 1940s until they got, got uh, run out of there during the McCarthy period. Um, and uh, at that point, my dad moved to uh, back up to Harlem and started a newspaper that was called Freedom. And Paul Robeson was the publisher. My dad was the editor. And um, so I encourage anybody who is interested in uh, black leftists, uh, the, the, those papers are held at the Schomburg Library in New York City. And I think many of them are online. Um, so, so that was the relationship. My brother's named after him, Charles Roby. And uh, it was a close relationship for many, many years before uh, my dad died prematurely as a relatively young man. In terms of my mom, my, my mom has done the opposite. My mom is a long liver. She's 107. She's doing well. She used to ask me, she still asks, um, what are you doing and what happened to the socialist project? <laughs> <laughs> so she is still engaged. Uh, she is still engaged and she's a lifelong radical lifelong radical um and uh she passed that on to her children right on so i'm afraid we're gonna have to leave it there linda burnham co-editor of the book power concedes nothing how grassroots organizing wins elections thank you for joining us on freedom now kpfk los angeles thank you so much gerald i truly appreciate it And in closing, we'd like to thank our guest, Peter J. Hammer, Linda Burnham, our producers, Dr. Gerald Horn, Sister Flora, Sister Femi, Sister Luyanda, Brother Brandon, and all those who made today's program possible. Please stay tuned for our sister Assumpta coming up next with Spotlight Africa, addressing issues facing Mother Africa. This program can be reheard for the next 60 days. Go to kpfk.org, audio archives, scroll to Freedom Now. Signing off for Freedom Now, this is Sister Thage. And until next week, as always, we stand ready for revolution. <laughs>